The history of Ballybock House is inextricably linked to the history of slum clearance. This building is one of 21 schemes that were designed and built from the early 1930s and occupied in stages during the Second World War and into the 1940s. Dublin Corporation's flat block programme was initiated by key legislation introduced in the early 1930s by the first Fianna Fáil government who stayed in power until 1948 and they really wanted to tackle public health and the urban poor in earnest. So they really initiated these slum clearance projects. One of the first things they did was appoint a housing architect to Dublin Corporation. That architect was called Herbert Sims and he seemed to run a very well oiled machine to make as many houses as possible through the 1930s. Ballybock House was built explicitly for the area of Ballybock and North Strand where there would have been a lot of insanitary housing in the form of very small low-lying cottages. But it was also earmarked for the big community and lots and lots of families who were being moved out of the Dockland area. These people, they needed new housing, but they wouldn't be able to afford um, the transport costs of living far out. They would turn up in the docks every day and not know if they would get work or not. And so that the casual nature of the labour meant that it was difficult to, to be living outside of the city. It was difficult to know whether your income was reliable or not. Um, and they, they specifically asked if they could come into the new housing scheme here Poplar Row or Ballybock House and also the new housing scheme beside Albert House down on Portland Row. At the time when they were finished and this particular scheme Ballybock House was finished in about 1939 it would have represented extreme improvement for people especially coming out of the tenements. If you were to stay in the tenements through the 20th century still by the 1960s you might not have electricity in your building. So what these buildings did regardless of whether they were ever too small or not or whether they were stacked up or not they brought great physical comfort and a lot more domestic technology. As a result of the complicated sites being in the city centre, the team came up with a very particular building type and that is a block of about 45 metres long, four storeys high. The front of it was the street front, so it's the supposedly public front where you use all your fancy materials, where you spend your money on really good brick. There's lots of lovely features, there's playful corners, and that's the side that looks out on the street and talks to the city. And then the other side is actually where all the excitement really happens because it's where the families enter and exit by means of a staircase per range and then these continuous balconies called decks. In the case of Ballybock House, the, the significant defining feature here is the Talca River. And what Sims and his team does is they get the block I've described 45 metres wide, four storeys high, and they get three of them and they hinge them together at these points where there are these arched entrances. So it's three blocks hinged and moving slightly to the rhythm or the curve of the Talca River. But also that movement leads to greater street variety. It's not coincidental that the first generation of architects and officials who were charged with this task, that they went on a study tour in 1925 to Amsterdam, Rotterdam and parts of Britain to look at what had been going on there because there was a big, uh, there was a big migration of rural population in Holland um, that led to the need to create these big urban, and urban housing schemes um, in Amsterdam. Um, and much of what we see here in Dublin initially would be very influenced by that Dutch housing which would be known as the Dutch, Dutch Expressionism or the Amsterdam School. Herbert Sims, he hadn't actually spent much time in Holland as far as we know and um, but he was very influenced and went on a study tour himself in the late 20s to Manchester and Liverpool and he was likely very influenced by what was happening in London in terms of philanthropic housing and the idea in those schemes was to create a more communal space where everybody could partake and they passed each other by in the way into their homes and, and such. What's really interesting is that between 1932 and 1939 over 1,000 flats were built in Dublin City. They must have represented something really new and different. So when he came to design these with his team, he was thinking about, well, how could we mediate these blocks and not make them seem so alien and strange and modernist? We could say that the fact that it's four storeys, flat roofed, very rectilinear, except for the curved corners and the brick and these predominant windows, that somehow these buildings are referencing the local Georgian architecture. But really, if we're trying to understand 
uh, modernism in Ireland, we, we can't look past these flats. They really are an, an exemplar of Irish architectural modernism. I think these buildings, by now, 90 years later or thereabouts, we can really see them as part of our urban heritage or urban history. I don't think any of us could imagine a Dublin without these buildings. The story attached to Herbert Sims is very interesting because he committed suicide in 1948 and in his suicide letter he talked about being overworked and he couldn't take it any longer. Um, and the kind of the, pre the personal tragedy attached to that means that uh, we've been very, in the last 10 years, we've been, we've been very attracted to that story. Um, and the history of the flats becomes a history of this one man's work uh, and his, his hard work and sacrifice on behalf of, of, you know, generations and generations, thousands and thousands of Dubliners. The meaning of these flats in the city, linking them to Herbert Sims, but also linking them to the sense of crisis at the time that, that gave birth to them, their origins, but then their legacies that in fact, we've been passing them by and ignoring them and not realising that they were disclosing thousands of families' lives and enabling so many families' lives. They become a really important part of who we are and, and our whole kind of emotional and historic DNA.